Princess Lost. This is yep. one of those Christmas songs that I've heard all my life, and I have no idea who this guy was or why anybody would write a song about him. Well, you know, the first thing to note is that Good King Wenceslas is not actually a Christmas song. Okay, great place to start. That's yeah. my, my first uh, misunderstanding <laughs> has been ticked off. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the song actually talks about an incident that takes place on December 26th, which I is see. Boxing Day. And it's also called the Feast of Stevens. Okay, and I remember that lyric from the song something Mm -hmm, about the feast of stevens okay yeah so boxing day or the feast of stephen is um it's traditional for the rich to um take care of the poor on those days they'll donate money or goods or other things to them um and i mean it's kind of evolved into a day when a lot of people box up excess things that they own and take them to thrift shops or donate them or you know just any number of things it's not popular in the states but where boxing day is huge that's that's where it's evolved from is this idea of the feast of stephen it's also the second day of onk (laughs) Onk. anyway we're not going to get into that because that's that's a whole nother thing but anyway podcast yeah so the first thing to note is good king wenceslas is about a king Actually, he's a duke. <laughs> okay, so basically everything about this song is a lie, or at least everything I understood <laughs> about it just is not true. It's very hard to say what about this song actually occurred and what is just um, kind of made up. Sure. Uh, you know, to kind of give us a good idea of what this guy was actually like. So uh, the Duke of Wenceslas was born around 903 A.D., so he's a 10th century duke mm. from Czech, Czechoslovakia, and, and so which was Bohemia. That was Bohemia at the time. And was Wenceslas mm-hmm. then a, a province or a city there? Or was it just the name of his home? Or was this his, his surname? That's or? his last name. I see. Okay. <laughs> yep. Whew, I know um, nothing about this. Well, actually, I think that's it. It's actually his first name. But yeah, oh, so okay. Wenceslas is his name. And he was a duke. And um, born 903 in Pra, or sorry, yeah, in um, Bohemia. Uh, he actually went to college at Prague, which is in Bohemia. Um, he was very well educated, and he had no desire to be a ruler at all. That wasn't what he was aspiring to be. Um, his father was a Catholic, and he was very, very devout Christian. Um, and he raised Wenceslas in the very traditional Christian manner, and so he was raised Catholic, um, and he loved everything about Catholicism, especially um, the aspects of giving to those who are in need. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, uh, unfortunately, his mother. Uh, was not on board with this idea and this is what caused a lot of issues later on so his mother was of a different faith Uh, all that they say is that she was a pagan but i mean back in those times anybody who was not christian was considered pagan (laughs) right it's it's basically (laughs) it could be everything else (laughs) yep everything else that was not like straight laced right to the letter catholic was pagan so so like depending on who you're talking to even like a different flavor of catholicism could have been referred to as pagan Exactly. Yeah, she might have been kind of a reformed type of Christian, but we don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so she and um, his younger brother were considered pagans, and they were not of this Christian um, uh, belief. Anyway, his father died, and when his father died, there was a power struggle between Wenceslas and his younger brother. And um, it actually was to the point where it split Bohemia in two parts— Wenceslas ruling half of it with um, Catholic tradition and his younger brother ruling the other half with pagan tradition, whatever, whatever, that, <laughs> whatever <means>. that was. <laughs> gotcha. um, but Wenceslas's mother, um, she wanted to abolish everything um, Christian, well, Catholic specifically in Bohemia. And as soon as her husband died, she removed a whole bunch of Catholics from power and um, replaced them with pagans. <laughs> Again, whatever that means, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever that means. Um, 
and it was Wenceslas's grandmother, his father's mother, who was worried about uh, the the pagan takeover, essentially, and the wiping out of Catholicism from Bohemia. So she told Wenceslas, you need to stop this. It is your duty as a Christian. It is your duty to stop this from happening. You need to bring people to Christ. Um, you know, you need to, uh, to take care of this. So that's when Wenceslas tried to take power from his mother, and that's what caused Bohemia to split into two. Mm. Wow. So this, this song is rooted in something so much bigger than I had ever even imagined. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, I mentioned before, Wenceslas had no desire to be in power. He actually wanted to be a monk. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he studied how to be a monk. And he was very good at taking care of the poor and the needy. And he was even um, noted to have visited dungeons and crypts to um, service the people that were in those places. So in the dungeons, he would go and basically uh, sermon and um, uh, give help to the people in the dungeons. And then he'd go down to the crypts and pay respects to the people who had died. Um, and this was a very big deal to him. And he was very well known for being um, somebody who would take care of the needy. Well, now this is perhaps partly influenced by the fact that we're currently in the midst of the COVID stuff, but that, I mean, I'm just imagining a 10th century crypt or dungeon and just thinking like, man, that's, <laughs> that's genuinely risky stuff there in, you know, in terms of disease and things like that. That's, uh, yeah. that's not insignificant that he was willing to do that. Yeah, it was a really big deal. And funny enough, he, he was so good and there were so many stories told about um, how good of a a leader, a ruler he was, that it even reached all the way to England. Mm -hmm. And that is where this huge, like, idea of the really righteous king comes from. Oh, is so, actually uh, so this, this kind of almost, kind, not to say he wasn't good, but this even more, like, sort of mythologized version of, of Wenceslas is born mm -hmm. in, in England then. Yeah, I well, see. that and it is in Czech, too, because they loved him there, too. Gotcha. But he was so good that um, it spread, like, how good of a, a, a leader, a ruler, too. Ah, right, right, right. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, that's where we get this vision of the, of the really good king. Um, and, yeah, it took off in England. And that's where a lot of these stories of the really good kings start coming from in England. Um, and he was such a good king that um, a word of his deeds reached Rome. And the emperor of Rome at the time uh, actually sent him a bunch of relics from saints. And um, I mean, we're, back we're in these like, times. What, like, like fingers and stuff? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so different saints would have like different um, items that were dear to them. Ah, and they were believed to have magical powers. Gotcha. And that was a relic. And the, um, the leader of the Roman Empire at the time was so impressed with Wenceslas that he sent him several relics from some saints. And so he essentially sent him magical powers. Mm. <laughs> and, and Wenceslas being so enthusiastic about Catholicism, this would have been pretty cool for him, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so unfortunately, um, Wenceslas's mother was so concerned about his popularity and how good he was doing that she arranged to have his uh, paternal grandmother murdered. She was the one, you know, that initially uh, encouraged Wences Wenceslas to um, seize power right. and, you know, to save the Catholic faith from being exterminated in Bohemia. Um, but she caused the death of, of his paternal grandmother. And then on the 28th of September, um, oh, geez, and I didn't write the date down. Uh, he was like 40 years old, about mm -hmm. maybe 50. Um, his, uh, his mother convinced his younger brother to kill him. Wow. So, so <laughs> if we're feeling like there's a little too much drama at our own holiday parties, we, uh, we, we could just sing a round of Good King Wenceslas and remember it could always be worse. Yep. Well, um, basically, he became a martyr as soon as that happened. And Bohemia 
and especially Czechoslovakia, they celebrate Good King Wenceslas Day on September 28th every year, which is the day that he died. <laughs> huh. I didn't um, even know he had his own day. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And he is the patron saint of Czechoslovakia. And he is um, known as uh, the patron saint um, that takes care of the poor and the needy. Interesting. So, so where this 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 song is familiar, the the song that's familiar to me, it has you know Anglo origin. Do you know? Do you, do you think they is it Actually, something that you hear people singing in Czechoslovakia it, on September twenty eighth? It has Czech origins. Oh, does it? Was it? A, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was originally written. So it's funny. The song is plagiarized from an old Czech poem written by a um, Czech named Vaclav Aloy I can't even say his name it sounds I'll fun though Vaclav um, so he wrote it in Czech German and Latin it was written in the 13th century this poem about good King Wenceslas so we are talking a little while after Wenceslas's yes. actual time so it's funny after Wenceslas died there were four biographies written about him and those were spread far and wide um, and you don't know exactly what all in them is true and what is not. Sure, um, a bit of a Legend of King Arthur situation, I'd imagine. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, anyway, about the 13th century, there's actually a tune written. So the tune is actually Tempus Addest Floridum, which is a, a tune written about spring flowers um, when they bloom first after the frost is done. And um, so the, the tune itself is from the 13th century. That's I, not the lyrics, but the tune. You know, I feel like mm. I can hear that in the tune. You know, it sounds like that. It sounds like flowers blooming and stuff. Yeah. So it was a 19th century Czech poet. So this is in the 1800s. That um, So there was a 19th century Czech poet who initially wrote um, this poem about good King Wenceslas. And like I said, he wrote it in German, Latin, and um, Czech. And it was published in a book. And um, it was in 1853 that this English hymn writer, um, who was actually famous for uh, writing a, a bunch of hymns and Christmas tunes and transposing them from other languages, mm -hmm. he got a hold of this uh, this big poem that was written this poem has like 13 stanzas and um he took that and used that to make this song about good king wenceslas and he just fit it to the tune <laughs> i see i see yeah so i'm thinking the the five or six verses of good king wenceslas that i usually see like oh that's a pretty long song but he was working from like a like a like a beowulf size tome of yes. poetry and just kind of pulling and making it fit Yes, but all of the main features are there, and that's how we know that he plagiarized, or at least took so heavily from that poem that you may as well say he plagiarized from the original poem. So the, the poem includes a king who sees a poor person gathering wood and decides to help. He and his servant gather food, wine, and wood to take to the poor people who have gathered in the woods. Um, the servant, like it's cold night, there's snow on the ground. The servant can't move any longer in the cold, and the king tells the servant to follow in his footsteps, and it will be easier to move along. And they make it to the poor people, and they celebrate with them. Mm -hmm. um, those are very specific uh, details, especially um, when it starts out, when he's looking out on, it's the Feast of Stephen, he's looking out in the night, there's fresh snow on the ground, and there's a poor person gathering wood for a fire. And so it, those are so specific in detail that it's so hard to say, well, you know, no, he made this up himself. <laughs> yeah, if we had some, what did you say? This was this guy was working in what, the 13th century, did you say? 18th century? 1800s, no? Yeah, 1800s? Yeah, 1800s. So if we had a, if we had a 19th century uh, copyright lawyer on this, they'd, <laughs> they'd definitely have a few proofs to bring before the judge at this point. Yes. Yep, they absolutely, and it would be seen as, as plagiarism, like 100%. There's too many... Um, too many things that are the same going on. Of course, he'd anyway. be like, "Hey, you know, I I, I, I work for a nonprofit. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, he'd be like, it's um, what would they call it? It's it's under fair use. He'd like find some way to try to weasel out of it, right? 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> it's so old, I can do whatever I want. Right, something it. like that. So um, the interesting thing is that the story in the poem was written hundreds of years after Good King Wenceslas was alive. Mm -hmm. It's um, not clear whether or not that story came from one of the biographies, but it's also hard to know if the biographies were accurate to what he actually did. But the, um, the heart of the story is there, the heart of who this person was, and it makes it so that it's plausible that something like this could have happened. So in that case, you could say that this is an accurate portrayal of King Wenceslas, which, by the way, after he was killed, um, he was named king. Um, it was the Romans that ended up giving him that title posthumously. Oh, that I is see. why we call him King Wenceslas. Oh, gotcha. All right. Mm -hmm. I got it. Well, I really like this a lot. I had honestly, <laughs> I had never looked, heard all of, or at least understood all of the lyrics until prepping mm -hmm. for this episode and reading through them was actually a lot of fun, but it becomes a lot more fun with all of this history that you've given to it. Yeah. And you know, yeah. I, I love this kind of stuff. These, these stories that come down to us from so long ago and, uh, you know, understanding that like, you know, the, in in modern in the modern use of the word true maybe yeah maybe it's like factually <laughs> perfectly accurate but it may very well describe a you know personal attributes uh yeah. you know give an idea of who this guy was and i'll be honest until now this song has been kind of one of those cheesy fringe christmas tunes that i've never really been very into oh well and now suddenly i'm like way into this i really like this now you know <laughs> It's funny that you say that because I actually, um, I looked up the reactions of people at the time in 1853 to this song. <laughs> what were the and hot takes? <laughs> they didn't, well, so the general public liked it, but the critics hated it. Oh, sure, them critics. They said that it was not Christian at all mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. It was fluff, it was propaganda, it um, was expected to fade and die with history. They also said that it was um, it was just like uh, they were incensed that <laughs> he took that tune from the 13th century, put lyrics to it about a 10th century king, and then tried to sell it as like a new Christian tune. <laughs> so, so this is like, like Chris this would be like if today we took like oh who knows like last christmas i gave you my heart or something yeah. and then but then also set it to the tune of like some sacred hymn and then like released it on the radio and like all the critics would be like you know this is just fluff this is ridiculous <laughs> this is what's wrong with com consumerism and this will never last and then centuries later it's still around yeah and you know what i think it's very fair to say that it is 100 percent the way that we react to songs that are created now that are being sold as christmas songs and we just say i don't think so that's not a traditional christmas tune and speaking of which did you know that up until just recently within the last 50 75 years um christmas hymns were not considered hymns and were not sung in churches really i had no idea yeah they were considered to be inappropriate for a a nice like Christian setting and it wasn't until um, people really started to read the lyrics and listen to the melodies and they're like you know what these are really nice tunes I think they can be sung in a church setting and that's when they started to be sung in a church setting wow, how interesting that yep. that kind of tracks of course I'm no historian I don't know how exactly it would tie together but I was I, when I was talking to uh, to Tim Cummings about uh, Christmas carols he was, he mentioned that you know carol even the word carol comes from uh, th this idea of singing and dancing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine just in this like sort of vague ethereal grasp that I have of history, which is very vague and very <laughs> ethereal, but I can <laughs> kind of imagine like a, like a long, long, long time ago, a sort of maybe you might say like more free or natural kind of, yeah, dancing is cool kind of religious movement existing. And then this, this sort of ratcheting down and tightening up of like what's permissible within the walls of a synagogue or church um becoming coming closer to like what i understand to be like a sort of a victorian england kind of sentiment of like what's appropriate and what is very inappropriate one should never do this one should always do that and then so, so then at that point like carol's becoming like 
oh music of the plebs you know this is like this is like pop music it's not sacred enough and then <laughs> and then kind of coming out of that again yep who knows yeah. maybe, maybe i should cut all of that out because that's just me being a wild speculator really <laughs> no, it's no um you know it's it's interesting uh that it used to be that um, I mean, you know, pagans, a lot of times when uh, when they refer to pagans, it was anybody whose religious rituals included things like loud singing, dancing, drinking, making merry, um, you know, things like that. And then the Christians came in and were very um, subdued and calm and quiet and quiet, you know, and they just really wanted to be as still as possible, <laughs> it mm -hmm. seems. And so these traditions of being you know loud and boisterous and celebrating in a loud way you know they they thought was offensive to the spirit of of a god you know mm -hmm. whereas the ones that were singing and dancing and making loud they felt like no that is the appropriate way to celebrate you know the amazingness of being alive and the amazingness of what you know their god had had provided and given to them so it's just different opinions and different viewpoints on what is appropriate and what is not. But yeah, eventually the idea of being loud was viewed as inappropriate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In one way or another, whether it's via my <laughs> mad speculations or just... It, it is fun, though, to imagine these kind of cultural worlds colliding, you know, like at what point these these things come together and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Christmas carols 100% would have collided with... Um, religious things if you think about it that way yeah. you know you if you go into a church and a Christmas Carol is you know singing and dancing and being merry and being loud yeah like that's not gonna go over well <laughs> Yeah, uh, Wenceslas uh, definitely was a king who existed. Um, do not mistake him for the three that followed. They were not the guy that the song is written about. And the way that we know that is because of the, um, the poem that was written about the original good king Wenceslas uh, that was written by the Czech. Um, and, uh, you know, also the fact that soon after he died, he was seen as a saint and a martyr for Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is why they celebrate the 28th for him, and they don't celebrate any days for the, uh, the Wenceslases that followed in the few hundred years after. Gotcha. Record set straight. That's right. And let's dive in. Help me out with the pronunciation on this one, too, though, Vera. I don't know. Is it Wassel or Wassail or something else entirely? You know, uh, that's also... <laughs> Uh, up for debate. Um, gotcha. It's an old English word, and the pronunciation is most similar to West Hail. Mm. But I mean, nowadays we call it Wassel, Wassail, Wassel. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't go with Wassel. So yeah, I, I feel like I'm sounds not really do that silly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Wassail is going to be the closest to the old English that was originally being used. Gotcha, and what is it? So it's an old English word that means good health to you, hmm. or be healthy. Uh, so it's just seen as a general 
wish of wellness um, upon the person who you are, you know, uh, giving the greeting to. And in a lot of ways, it's a greeting as well as a well wish. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, this is another um, item that is not actually a Christmas thing. How cool. <laughs> Lay it on me. Give me some of this good info. All right. So way back, we're, we're talking like hundreds and hundreds, a thousand years ago in England. Um, they, uh, this was before they were very Christian. Um, they would have, you know, their harvest season. And then in the middle of winter, right around winter solstice, they would have another celebration. And this, you know, has roots back into the, the pagans um, that were around back then. And the pagans had huge celebrations around the solstice, especially winter solstice. And this is where Christmas originally comes from, is the celebration around winter solstice. And uh, the Christians pulled a lot of um, ideas and a lot of uh, elements from a bunch of other religions and beliefs and mashed them together to make the Christmas that we know now. But way back before that happened, in the winter solstice celebrations, one of the things that they would do is they would hold this really big party out in the fruit orchards, especially the apple orchards, and they would um, they would uh, have this big festival, and they were being loud and obnoxious because they wanted to wake up the trees, and it was um, a way to drive away evil spirits. And that would guarantee a good cider apple crop for the following year. They believed that the dancing, the singing, the bells, the instrumentation, the banging of sticks, and the costumes would make would wake up the trees from their slumber, and let them know that they are loved and appreciated. And you know that would help them also shake off any of the the evil spirits that have like managed to um, hang on to the sleeping trees. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So, so there might have been like then the next spring, the trees that bloom. It's like, yeah, we got through to those ones. But what, if one of them has like some some form of rot or mildew, it's like, ah, we didn't get the spirit off of that one. But darn it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, back then before they understood the science of things, that is how they would explain the unexplainable. And that's why you had um, things like, you know, these fall harvest celebrations where they would celebrate and thank gods for their bountiful harvest. Or if something went terribly wrong and they had a really bad harvest, they would find somebody in the community to blame for that really bad harvest. Well, you were a bad person. We're being punished for your badness. And then that person would oftentimes take the rap for everything bad going on yeah, and this, oftentimes would end up losing their life. Like this, um, it's got to be someone's fault to point this sort of way of seeing things. Yeah, yeah. They, they just were not capable I guess they, they were capable. The science was not there yet to explain exactly what was going on uh, with diseased trees and why diseases spread from one tree to the next, why a harvest is better one year versus the next year. It was just things that, you know, was mysterious to them. And mm -hmm. so the best way that they knew how to, um, to understand it was through, you know, rituals and things. And if you did a ritual, and something seemed to work, then they would latch on to it. Yeah, sure. Let's do it again next year. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And then it becomes tradition. So um, what is wassail, the drink? Now that we understand that, um, you know, it's, it's actually a wish of well-being. Uh, so where does this drink come into all this, you know? Yeah, yeah that's, that was throwing me off because I was like, man, I thought it was some sort of like maybe kind of fruity <laughs> drink. And, you know, can you just yell wassail or wassail anytime you drink anything? Yeah, uh, so essentially, um, when they were out there celebrating with the trees, it was cold, and they liked to have a hot drink with them. And oftentimes, that hot drink would be a mulled cider or wine or mead, and um, they would be, and the cider especially would be made from the apples from those trees. The cider apples were very important for making cider because back then it was not safe to drink water. That's something people always forget. Uh, people would drink um, drinks that had uh, some alcohol in them because the alcohol made the drinks sterile and safe to drink. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean everybody was falling over drunk everywhere. There's always just enough alcohol in it to make it safe to drink. Mm -hmm. And um, water was not drunk very often at all. It was 
you would drink more beer and ciders than anything else in your lifetime this long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so they would be drinking um, this uh, nice mulled cider or a mead or a beer. And um, I mean, of it was course, a big festival. We, we say so. nice. We, uh, odds are, like, to our modern palate, it probably didn't actually taste all that great, but... <laughs> Probably. You don't know. Yeah, who um, knows, right? I don't know. It might, it might have been delicious. <laughs> to them, it was probably amazing. Yeah, probably one of the <laughs> sweetest things they ever got to enjoy. Because they didn't have Kool-Aid. Right, you know? no Kool-Aid, no refined sugars. They were probably living on a bunch of tubers and potatoes most of the year. So, <laughs> so yeah, anything with any kind of sweetness to it, I'm sure, was just heavenly mm-hmm. to them. Um, but, yeah, so uh, and what do you do with a festival? You start to dress things up. And that's what they started doing to their drinks. So they started adding stuff to them, such as raisins and spices and other fruit drinks and things. You would have like uh, some people would have different wines that they would mix together. But the the main point of it was that it was a hot drink um, and it had some alcohol in it. And um, so this also started spilling into the cities um, and the villages and the towns. And so you would have Um, you would have poor people going around uh, doing small performances, if you will, for money. Um, Because the the wealthy people oftentimes were more willing to give in the holiday season of Christmas versus um, other other times of the year. So, you know, you've got this holiday coming up. You've got, you know, a whole bunch of people celebrating and whatnot. And the um, the wealthy have loosened their pocketbooks and are, you know, willing to give money and things to the poor. So the poor figured this out. And next thing you know, you have people basically on every street corner singing and asking for money, going from house to house, asking for money, <laughs> asking for things, um, well, this suddenly makes sense because there's that lyric in at least one of the wassail songs, Here We Go a Wassailing. Uh-huh. Yep. Here We Go a Wassailing. And um, so it's funny. If you look at the lyrics, all of the lyrics to these tunes, um, there's, okay, so there's a slew of lyrics first. Yeah. And but the lo- old. I, I didn't realize how many tunes there are that are based around wassail and wassailing. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's there a lot. There are a lot. <laughs> yeah. I have the lyrics for one of the many wassail songs here uh this is from uh tim cummings collection on this day earth shall ring um and we will fade out of this section to the the music of this tune the arrangement that he has um but here are the lyrics for it uh this is cornish wassail and insert your own preferred pronunciation of the word wassail in this uh tune i'm just going to read it like that wassail uh so it says now christmas is coming and new year begin pray open your door and let us come in with our wassail, 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 joy come to our wassail, was, or, or excuse me, joy come to our jolly wassail. Uh, so you can you can definitely hear that it there. Um, let us in. We're out in the cold. Uh, you know, good wishes to you, etc. Yes. Um, so, in some of those old versions, you will see where they're first complimenting the master and the lady of the house, and also the children. And then they are asking for anything that they have to spare, be it a cup of hot beer or to let them go stand for a bit by the hearth so that they can warm up a little bit um, or food, perhaps. And one of the lines that they one of the lines in one of the songs essentially said, you know, thanks for um, for sharing your plentiful with us. And please think about pour us out in the cold freezing while you're enjoying your nice warm house with all of your things <laughs> wow so this is like a, a really well put together like pre-packaged panhandling script yes like here first you, you lead with compliments yep. you give a little dose of guilt you point <laughs> out you know it, lucky you and poor me it, and I'm, I'm seeing, I feel like I'm seeing a direct connection to that line in uh, We Wish You a Merry Christmas. That exactly. Suddenly they're like, now bring us some figgy pudding. Yes. I, I, I've always been like, that's so demanding. Like, what, what's the deal with that? Yeah, it is that exact same thing. 
this is exactly where those things come from. Interesting. And the lyrics, you know, they change over time because people figure out what works better because after a while you're like, I eh, heard it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got to shake it up a bit. <laughs> Doesn't work so well anymore. That, that or the person who's out there doing the singing is like, I'm tired of wassail. I want figgy pudding. I'm going to change the lyrics. <laughs> you know what? Enough of this wassail stuff. So the thing to think about, though, with that wassail is because you had children doing this too, right? Mm-hmm. So the wassail drink that they would have ready for these Christmas carolers that would come running around, um, it was a warm mold cider drink. And um, oftentimes it would have um, orange slices, raisins, and a, a type of a bread that could be served with it that they could sop up the drink with, almost like you would with soup and a roll nowadays. Yeah. Um, also, the, um, the wassail itself would, could be served in a very large or, ornate communal cup, and they would pass it around. So it's not like they'd bring out a cup for everybody. They'd bring out this big, beautiful, usually made of silver, ornate communal cup and then they would hand it over and the people would sip out of it and pass it along. And Pretty it had just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it had just enough alcohol in it that it would make, that would warm them up yeah, and them would, warm, you'll get the circulation back into their toes and their fingers. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that is, that is the kind of the history. Now, as for like a recipe for wassail yeah have you ever made it i have tell me about that okay so there are as many recipes as there are lyrics to this tune ah, gotcha, yeah. <laughs> because of the fact that it has evolved over time oh yeah it's been it sounds like it's been around for a very long time plenty of time yes. for people to experiment but if you want to do um, probably the closest that you can to what might have been served a thousand years ago during these festivals I think you have to start with an apple cider. Um, alcoholic or not, you can use either one that you would wish. <clears throat> Put that apple cider into a large pot and then add in some cinnamon. I like to do one or two sticks of cinnamon. Um, or you can do apple pie spice because that's got all the right spices in it. Or um, if you do cinnamon, add some nutmeg um, and you know, maybe some cloves in there if you really want. And, um, that's all the right stuff for, for a good you know, yeah. seasonal <laughs> aromatic experience for sure. And I recommend using a pressed apple cider. Don't use an apple cider that comes from concentrate, please. That's mm. not real stuff. <laughs> and that's so it, get, for, for anybody identifying other than using the good old Ned Flanders, uh, <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't know what it was. It's like, <laughs> if it's, if it's cloudy and brown, you're in cider town. <laughs> if it's, yes. If it's sweet yes. and clear, you got juicy there mister i can't remember now what is what exactly you said but, but yeah yeah like yeah cider is typically a clouded color and there is some excellent cider to be had here in utah um and it's not alcoholic you can get the non-alcoholic and it's amazing there's some that they sell at Rolly's red barn down south utah county you can also pick some up at smith's uh, treetop does a version I've of, got a bottle of that apple in cider the fridge. There you go. You got the good stuff. We should check with Danny. I think Danny L Lindell in the band. He's he's uh -huh. got his family's got some orchard land down there in uh, what what is that town? Genoa. Oh, uh, nice. I wonder if yeah. they're contributing in any way to any of these ciders. They might so, be cherries. I'm not sure if they're apples actually. But. The other thing to add to this to just make it that much more special, add some pressed orange juice. Mm. Notice I said pressed. Don't get the concentrate. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> Add some orange juice, or you could add um, some cherry juice, because uh, uh, you know, were thinking about the wines that they had back then. Mm. Um, but I like orange juice in this. Um, and you heat it up, make sure that you stir it regularly, um, and then just serve it and enjoy. It's an amazing hot drink that I love. Like I've been making it for years around Christmas time because I just think it's so good. Um, and I mean, yeah. if you look online, there's lots of other things you can add to it. Um, people like to put raisins in it. <laughs> yeah, I like most foods. I'll be honest, just for me personally, raisins are like one of the only things I'm like, why is this even around? I'd much rather have a grape. <laughs> I don't understand why we had to do this to this poor grape. <laughs> Humiliated grape. 
But that, what you described sounds delicious. I know that I've had wassail of some kind before, but I think it was basically hot Kool-Aid, which oh, was like geez. not super delicious. No, <laughs> but no. What you're describing sounds pretty darn good. Yeah, you know, like, give it a shot. Um, and I like to do um, like one part of um, apple cider and then maybe one quarter to one third part orange juice. And you can absolutely play with the amounts. I mean, there is no set like this is wassail. This is the official real wassail because over the years it has evolved so much. And, you know, it, it was everything from beer to wine to mead to cider way back when, you know, they were singing wassail. So however we do it, it's probably authentic to some time period. <laughs> Unless you're using stuff from concentrate, then yeah, it's authentic to no time period. <laughs> right. If, it, if it's hot Kool-Aid, then uh, that's not quite it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but I highly recommend people give it a go. Yeah, um, and I want to know if anybody tries this, especially if somebody pairs this with Jeff's shortbread recipe. It'd be so fun. Yeah, oh, yeah, geez, yeah. yeah. And there's lots of um, recipes online. You don't have to do it in a pot on the stove. You can do it in a slow cooker. Um, you can do it in an instant pot if that's what you're into. <laughs> One more use for the instant pot. I mean, you could probably put it in a Dutch oven and stick that in your oven if you really want it <laughs> to. <laughs> I'm going to smoke my waffle this year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Just go stick it in the smoker outside and let it go. Anyway, um, yeah, wassail, what an incredible drink that's named after an old English word that means good health to you.